Hi folks, programming CNC lathes and specifically dual spindle lathes. This video walks through an absolutely awesome workflow and way on how you can automate your programming, how you can run these parts separately and get them running really quickly. Let's dive in. The example we're gonna use, incredibly simple lathe part, but an awesome example of a part where we wanted to run about 300 of these and programming it with a dual spindle lathe improves parting to a life and it lets us run these, walk away and come back when they're done. Much better workflow than having to run a second operation to properly clean up and machine that back side. The first step is not in our part file, but rather in this master template. And we'll have this available cart here to download. With the file open, we're gonna activate our part placeholder component, right click on our actual part file and insert into current design. Click OK. Enable the visibility on our stock main spindle component and you'll notice that there's a joint origin. That's not quite at the face of the part. It's just a smidge behind it. And that distance is one of the many important user parameters to this video, which we'll come back to in a second. I'm going to turn off the visibility of the stock main spindle, hit J on the keyboard to create a joint. We're gonna join the front of our part, reactivate that stock component visibility to not the front of the stock, but rather that origin right behind it. Click OK. We're also going to measure our part. This is one of the few manual processes that you have to do. We click the front face, hold shift and click the back face. We can see it's 0 0.925 inches. Click on your FX or user parameters. You don't have that up there. You can pin it to your toolbar. And part length, we're gonna say negative 0.925. And a couple other variables that we need to change here. What is the stock that we're using? We'll say one inch. You'll notice that parametrically updates, really cool. The main stock length, we'll say two inches. This is how far out the raw material is sticking. And I generally do not change the 15 thousandths of main spindle and sub spindle part off. And that 15 thousandths is the distance between the front of the part and the front of the raw material. So it's how much it's gonna turn off when we first start. The other really important variable is sub-spindle chuck on distance. This is how far forward our sub-spindle is gonna come on and grab our part. And if there's one thing that's confusing when you're moving from a traditional lathe to a dual spindle lathe, it's that idea of what is my sub-spindle work coordinate system? What offset is it? How do I program it? How do they talk to each other? This template handles all of that. In this case, I'm gonna to wanna to grab onto it somewhere in the middle of this face. And if we look at the distance between the front of our part and the back, it's 0.35 to 0.65. So about 0.45 inches looks fine. You'll also need to input the width of your parting tool. If you use the same parting tool every time, you'll never have to change this value though. And the beauty in this workflow is not only does it give you a safe and reliable, easy way to program dual spindle parts, but many turning features and parts are really conducive to automated or templatized CAM. So when we hop into the manufacturing workspace, we may have a bunch of warnings and red arrows, but I assure you a significant portion of the work is done. Case in point, your facing already done, your roughing pass already done, your finishing pass can already be done. Certain features like any live tooling, certain drilling, you better repick holes, but the lion's share of the work is already ready to go. So not only does this save you time on programming the cam operations, but you can create one of these generally for each material, for steel or for aluminum, and it will save not only your speeds and feeds, but your preferences of how you're roughing, finishing, radial depths of cut, stock to leave, etc. So let's do a quick recap. We inserted our lathe part into the part placeholder component, and we had to update a couple of user parameters. That's really it. So how do we handle our main and our sub spindle work coordinate system? Well, the key to this workflow is it's already been handled. The face of your Royal collet system, it could be a chuck as well, but it happens to work really well with any sort of a collet system. The face of that collet is your G54. And you see that here in the fusion workflow. Our main spindle work coordinate system is at the center of that collet. It never changes. For some people, this is a deal breaker. They really like having the work coordinate system at the end of their raw material so that they can see manual G-code values and they can read through the code. 
I absolutely do not care about that, although there is one exception on the subspindle that I'll mention where I think this workflow actually even still does a better job. For your subspindle, it's the same thing. Now, the distance between these two is not meaningful in this example, but it will give you an idea of when we look at our subspindle, the G55 co coordinate system, and that's represented under our setup, post-process WC offset number two, is the face of that as well. So once, when we got our machine about a year ago, we set those. We have never had to change them yet, which is absolutely awesome. So G54 is the face of our main spindle. G55 is the face of our subspindle. On the Haas lathe, to set that G54 offset that we only have to do once, we first measure a tool with the tool probe. We then bring that tool up to the face of the collet. We used a piece of paper so that we weren't actually touching the cutting tool to the collet face. With the G54 Z-axis value selected, we hit Z-face measure on the control. That may be different for your machine, particularly if it's a different brand. So make sure to include training if you're getting one of these machines or reach out to your reseller. There's one more offset that matters, and that is G54 B0. On a subspindle lathe, the B axis is the axis that moves in Z with the subspindle. We need to set this again just once so that the machine understands how the main spindle and the subspindle move relative to each other. So when in G54, B0 is when the two spindles are touching. To set this, I brought them together with a piece of paper that was 3 thousandths of an inch thick, set that value, and then adjust it by the 3 thousandths of an inch. For us, that value is negative 27.796 as a machine position. We manually type that in to our G54 B axis value in the offsets table. And this is the key to this workflow because we've got some construction geometry which you can poke through. It's pretty cool. In particular, the sketch point in the main spindle file here that dictate how that subspindle comes in and grabs that part subject to the 0.45 inches that we programmed in the user parameters. To program this part or any other lathe part, we can continue to program any necessary lathe turning operations. Again, with templates like this, I find it's easier to have extra drilling and boring and threading operations because you can delete them if you don't happen to need them for a specific operation or part you're making. But two things you're not allowed to do. You're not allowed to change the, subs the secondary spindle chuck on a return or the parting operation. Now you can change the parting speeds and feeds, but that's the other quirk to this workflow is that the simulation shows that the parting is happening at the front of the part. And the reason it looks like that is that the parting is happening after the subspindle has already grabbed on to the raw material and pulled it forward so that the former front of the part is now the back of the part. We want to hold on to the part with both spindles for two reasons. Number one, you need to be holding on to it to complete the transfer to the subspindle. The second reason is that you're going to get much better parting tool quality and parting life by supporting the part on both sides. That way the parting tool can come all the way through and not have the part fall off before finishing the cut. We can then activate our subspindle setup, and I've got a setting enabled at the bottom of the screen called Synchronize View and Visibility with the Active Setup. So you'll notice when I activate my subspindle, it's going to flip it around and show that subspindle orientation. It's actually a great feature. And we can now see our facing tool come in to face, profile, and finish off that part. One of the reasons that I really like having our G55 Z0 be the face of the subspindle collet is that that subspindle is often no man's land when it's running. It's very difficult to see it through the window of the machine tool. And with flood coolant and the speed that lathes move at, it's really nerve wracking. There have been a number of times and parts where we've tried to machine or thread features relatively close to that subspindle. And what I like about this is that when I post the code, I can look at moves like the posted location of the code right here. And so long as I see that it's still a Z positive value, I know my tool isn't going to run or crash into my subspindle. Another great feature, it's been around in Fusion for a while now, is to edit the cat of this part in the same file. And you probably are familiar with the anchor or the chain link that is the linked component. But it used to be the case that you had to open up or find and open up the Fusion file and edit it that way. Now with this pencil, we can actually edit this file or the geometry the sketches, the extrusion, all that in place right here. Click that little green check when you're done. 
The reference file is obviously updated as well, and we're still in our cam file. Makes it really quick if you're trying to change a fillet or a chamfer or a feature or a hole depth to not have to go find files, save other files, etc. Really like that feature. I'm also a big fan of comments. So you can see this, both these setups are littered with comments. I've got a reminder to myself here to update the part length. Again, that's something you really don't want to forget to do with this workflow. Um, I've got a couple of manual NCs just to make sure the B axis is clamped. That way the uh, machine doesn't give an error when we try to run the program. I've got a pass through M31 and an M33. This just turns the chip conveyor on and off. So usually once I got a program running, I'll decide how long I want it to run and I'll just drag that off, say down here so that the chip conveyor will be running during say these two operations. And a couple more comments and pass throughs on the sub spindle. In particular, this last one is adjusting the location of the parts catcher. I have it set to a relatively safe value. You'll wanna use this at your own risk and I would really encourage you to do it at 5% rapids, single block or option stop. Really go slow if you're new to the machine. Make sure you have everything set up correctly and your machine isn't behaving differently than ours for reasons, uh, whether it's the post or the machine itself and settings. But we wanna move that B axis forward, but that distance depends on the length of our part and where our parts catcher happens to be set. Uh, on the Haas, the parts catcher setting that location is a very manual process with a crest wrench. So I actually really don't like changing it when I don't have to. Uh, I'd much rather change it and leave it set up in the software so that it just stays consistent regardless of what part we're running. This is also a rare example of where we're using any form of actual pass-through G-code to control the machine's motion. I'm incredibly cautious when I do that because it can have unintended consequences if you aren't moving the machine in the correct way. I generally much prefer that the posts handle that, but again, this is an example where I wanna control moving the X and the Y out of the way before the subspindle moves forward. My guess at some point is that uh, Autodesk or somebody will have a sort of a more robust solution to this, similar to how they have the subspindle chucking in return operations right now that you can see under the turning menu. But these things end up getting really complicated because of how many different versions and variations and machines and brands and models and setups and so forth. So inevitably, I think we're gonna have to continue to have a small amounts of G-code over time, but again, the great thing about this is that other than adjusting the parts catcher location value, um, that code never has to change. Two final important workflow tips. Number one, try not to save over your master template when you're forking it off to work on an individual part file. So we'll do that by just going to file, save as, and rename it accordingly. We of course will make changes to the master template when we've made updates to what we want to templatize as our cam, our setup, our tools, our fees and speeds, et cetera. And finally, this all gets tied together very eloquently with NC programs because it allows you to save some really important settings. For us, that includes the output folder for how this gets mapped to the network drive where our machines are wired over ethernet. It allows us to save the correct post processor, which is increasingly important on things like dual spindle lays. And it allows us to retain really important variables. Again, in the case of dual spindle lays, things like the secondary spindle and max spindle speed. If you're running batches of parts, you can also use this M97 looping. I'll often just leave it at one, but what's great about that is that when the code is then posted at the machine, we can update the L1 to say L5, and we're now running batches of five parts. We will have some basic setup instructions for this file, as well as the Fusion version of it over to download on the NYC CNC website. We're using this again on a Haas ST20Y. My understanding is it should work on many of the common dual spindle lathes. And in fact, a big shout out to Mr. Nelson, uh, who was the one who built off of the Rob Lockwood idea of using containerized uh, template style modeling to update it with some of these really cool expressions that help us get it to this level of automation. I believe he's using it uh, on his Doosan links. So hope you folks learned something. Hope you enjoyed. Take care. See you soon.